<laughs> Before we, we get into the process of making the film, I'd love to hear from uh, the filmmakers um, what, if you could maybe talk a little bit about what the review means to you. Um, Marty, perhaps we could start with you. Well, uh, back when it was first um, published, it was 63, it was the newspaper strike, I remember very well. Um, I was about 20, 21, I forget now, but I was, with, I was at Washington Square College, um, down by Green Street or whatever the main building was called, and uh, I, I had been there for, since 1960. Um, and there was a wonderful uh, news, newsstand in the building across the street. They had excellent magazines, sight and sound, all kinds of things, dissent, very foreign affairs, all kinds of stuff. And I saw this, uh, there were no newspapers, and I saw this New York Review, which um, looked like a paper, in a way, the paper, the quality of it, uh, um, and it, it uh, kind of, um, the headlines kind of grabbed me. Very, very interesting. I was curious as to what these things were about, who these people were, are. Um, it also was a, you know, I was 20 or 21. I mean, I was coming from a really, really lower working class background that became very conservative. Um, uh, was cut off from the rest of the city and pretty much uh, pretty close. To, you, you didn't think. There was no way to think. Um, you just. You, you behaved a certain way uh, because it was a tradition, um, certain, certain ways of. It never really made too much of a shift over to American way of life, particularly the older people who were running around in there. And so this was amazing to me uh, to pick this up and to start trying to read all of it if I could. And you know, we're talking 63, so we were just mentioning it earlier that. Um, the 60s, as you can get a sense in here, if you're uh, young and you, you were either born in the 60s or, 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 not, or born later in the 70s, whatever, you know, it was a very vibrant, very, very um, uh, extraordinarily uh, sense of complete revolt on every level. And at 63 was the first year of the New York Film Festival. The opening night film was The Exterminating Angel. You know, you had people like Blonsky, I think, right? This first one, right? Yeah. Knife in the Water, you had all these. And uh, you had the Warhol pictures. You, I mean, this was something that was happening. And it was happening out in the street. It was happening in your apartments, your homes. And um, the, the review reflected that, but with a different, a different viewpoint. Um, and, and you'd start to read something that, uh, that it's about a certain book, but actually the writer would go off on think about the subject matter of the book, in a way, and take you on another journey. Uh, whether the, it isn't like even a review of the book, in a way. It's uh, about uh, the, the situation, the subject, the thinking, pro and con, you know, always agree, but um, it's, I mean, for me, 50 years later, the curiosity is still there. And very exciting to see that front cover. Um, it has a, it made me feel less, it was not intimidating either, as I pointed out, until you opened it and started trying to read it. Was <laughs> 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 that a little bit of Wonder Boy, is that article? Wonder Boy is about, uh, Wonder Boy is about genius. Yes, read that one, interesting. <laughs> yeah, then it's followed up by the Coco Chanel thing, so that kind of thing. <laughs> but it, you almost think I, I, was, I thought I understood it until I read the next sentence. <laughs> and then the next one, you know. But it's fascinating. Why is there? You know, okay. But um, uh, no, it, 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 that's one of the things. That, and then, um, uh, so it is a life changing experience. And I do come out of that period of the 60s. I may mean, not have been involved um, radically in, in that world, but uh, uh, I was aware of it. And it also had to do with the emotion of the 60s, too, in that this was thinking rather than the emotion. And this is very important because I saw people go down, you know, things happen. Uh, out of the madness of the emotion, you know. Anyway, David, sorry. Yeah. Well, I had a very different experience. I started reading the review in the late 70s. And I'm not from New York. So, um, you know, 
I'm from uh, outside of Albany, New York, a very small yeah. town. <laughs> could be 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, the call toy thing where he says that, yeah, we were in Dublin and we find it and we get together and we talk about it. I responded to that because my whole image of New York was based on the New York of you. And um, when Avishai Mahalik talks about, you know, there's this mental Europe, I have this thing of a mental New York, you know, and the review is at the center of that. Um, and it's very New York institution for me. Like, uh, it's very natural that compared to, say, some other book reviews, there's a lot of conflict. I think New York is a place where people are very you know, clear about what they think and what they have to say. Um, so today, coming to New York, uh, it, it, it fulfilled that. Yeah, you have, uh, don't forget, Susan Sontag was making films. She was here at the film festival every, every year. She was writing about films. She was discovering the latest uh, um, young filmmakers coming out of the East and West Village. It was an amazing time. Uh, Norman Mailer was making films, while 90, and, and um, <coughs> a number of others, including uh, Andy. Yeah, yeah. Andy Wall, of course, was here all the time. He used to have the booths outside. At that time, it was the Avery Fisher Hall. And in the uh, promenade, they had the booths showing sleep and empire and that sort of thing. Constant, you know. Um, and they were all there. I was, I was able to get to the festival because um, I had a short film playing here and I was able to see all the, I was at the press screens. So I got to see all of you then start reading them in the review. Uh, before we uh, open it up for questions, I was hoping you could also maybe talk a little bit about shaping this film. Um, you're dealing with a 50 year history, um, a very long distinguished history. Um, what did you decide to focus on? And also, it's not, in some ways, it's not the most obviously cinematic subject. Um, but you obviously worked around that. But, uh, but you know, with, by, with, with just the variety of approaches, with um, new interviews, archival footage, um, you know, excerpt of text, could, maybe you could all talk a little bit about that. Well, I'll jump in. I, I don't really remember where we started. And I think that's part of the issue that, it's part of the reason why I do documentaries or non-fiction films, or they're, they're films to me, in a way. But, but, but it's, it's um, I don't like the, the, the um, categories. But the thing about them is that uh, David has edited the Bob Dylan No Direction Home, and did Shine a Light with me, and we did uh, George Harrison uh, Living in the Material World. And we always sort of start in the middle somewhere, I'm not quite sure, and then we sort of swim our way out. And it depends on how it feels, how one article, in this case, feels next to the other. Um, I think in a, in a kind of rhythm and like a piece of music almost like the, the, the lyrics or the words I should say, the, the literature itself is the music. Um, and somehow I try to touch upon these major, these major trends or events uh, uh, during that, during the 50 years. Um, and there were many that we tried, right, that sort of fell, fell away, sort of slipped away, distilled down. Yeah, I mean, one of the first conversations we had with Bob Silvers, he talked about the waves of history. And how, in a way, a publication like the Review is reacting to those waves of history. And of course, uh, you know, Vietnam, uh, Vietnam, you know, it's a little before my time, um, but I'm very aware of it. And of course, it was central to Marty's formation. And I think that we, you know, I read the Mary McCarthy pieces, which I never read before. I thought, hey, we can put this in. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and so, uh, uh, John Diddy. Yeah, the John Diddy and too, because uh, we filmed an event, uh, the 50 year anniversary event at Town Hall, where different contributors you know, read from their pieces or spoke, and, and she read from the um, Sentimental Journeys. And uh, Mike Palmer, actually, who's in the audience, who's an editor, he started to work with the words and he found a rhythm with the words and, and her writing. It was really, you know, that fell starting in the middle. We kind of yeah. started to find a, a so We started to reach our way out and around, whether it's the art world or, or literature or politics, um, the wave of history, yeah. I mean, also, you know, once we saw everybody on the stage and we decided to shoot the uh, town hall event, that we kind of started to get a sense of, um, uh, literally, uh, I mean, in a way, who really reads on camera? And uh, who might be better served just reading, literally, 
they are there by the words rather than having them be or you know and so this was something as we just went along it wasn't a matter of liking or disliking it just, it just was it's not something I can describe in words but it has to do with personality too in the film and Joan is very special or everyone in it um, and there were others too that ultimately had to melt away unfortunately but and I think part of it is, you know, it's a document uh, of today, but it's also the 50 years of the review. It's a document of the, of the time that's passed. And just the James, that James Baldwin piece, it, it, you know, I'm sure it was very strong when he said it, but when you see it today, it takes you back into that moment in a very powerful way. And I think those are the kinds of things we discovered. I mean, you know, we, we talk about the Mary McCarthy, um, the interview. You know, that, nobody had seen that for 35, 40 years. It was a film print um, in an archive, a local TV station in New York, where someone just asked her, you know, what a, uh, they just wanted to ask her about the Vietnam War on local television in New York. And she said, well, I, I, I don't know, that, you know, I'd like to affect the debate. I don't know what I could do, but, you know, maybe I could write something. And uh, you know that was a real find. I mean, for me, just quickly before we, just I, I don't purport to be I mean, you know, proposed to be somebody who was reading all this stuff at that time. I was learning really how to live with books and learn how to read really, um, and therefore there wasn't even right and left for me. It was a matter of what made sense or what made me think about other things, um, and so that's why I kept pursuing the review over and over again until that was a formative time. For In terms of approaching um, material, there wasn't a lot of archive that was directly related to the review, but there were all these events that were happening at that time. They had a lot of 50th anniversary events, and so we would just capture it. We were just basically documenting where it was, and we'd hear, you know, oh, there's going to be this, you know, symposium in Oxford. Well, let's go shoot it. You know, let's just go and let's talk to all the writers in a very, we, we talked to David and Marty interviewed writers in a way that we haven't really worked before. Usually with interviews, they're very, you know, they're very in-depth and you kind of know going in that it's going to be two hours, maybe three hours talking to someone and having, these were like, okay, 15 minutes, let's get in here. We had like 20 different people coming in and it was, a, it was interesting because they're so particular, they're so charismatic, they're so, they have so much to say that it was a very good way to kind of approach uh, the group with all the amazing contributors to the movie. From the viewpoint of working in the office at the New York Review when they were filming, it was remarkable. I, Bob and I used to talk about how is this going to be a documentary of people sitting around reading? <laughs> so they're going to be reading and reading manuscripts and calling them manuscripts interspersed with these interviews that they did from the very beginning. And the first time we saw, the, the first screening that we saw was, uh, was remarkable marvelous thing to us because it did, as Bob said, show the waves of history of the video. And it was completely unexpected to us. We had no idea what, what we were going to see the day we saw it the first time. And of course the verite footage of, or the, just the day-to-day -day footage of, of the work in the office and the way Bob interacts with his staff. And to me, those scenes are really, are really wonderful. And the, the archival that, that exists is amazing. I mean, that Penny Baker footage um, of, town, of Town Hall, Bloomington yeah. Hall, I mean, the Dick Cabot stuff, it's just uh, remarkable. Yeah. Well, let's we'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, let's we'll start in the front row. Oh, um, what was the thought process like behind uh, using narrative film clips, like opening the film with the opening of West Side Story? Where did that idea come from? Uh, the question is about the use of uh, the film clips. Uh, in, in the film West Side Story and Fahrenheit 451. Um, this is something that um, came up again. It's one of those things that came up as we were developing the picture and towards the end. Um, it has to do with memory, right? The quote. And um, the idea of knowing something but sharing it. Um, it is the New York Review. And what's the best ever aerial shots done in New York City? <laughs> it's so fast. <laughs> what are you going to do? Go up there and, and forget it. These are the ones, these are the shots. Symmetrical, perfect, moving a certain way. 
And so said, let's try it. And so I fell in love with it. No, you can't. That happens in the city. The idea is everything is bouncing around those buildings, you know. And you hear this uh, quote from Bob Sachs, isn't it? Yeah. Oliver Sachs. You know? And that was one idea. Then, then um, I always felt when I saw Fahrenheit 451, the Truffaut film, I was a great fan. I'm still a great fan of the picture. Um, and I always felt that uh, that incredible sense of loss and panic um, uh, when you realize that people had to memorize the book. Mm -hmm. uh, because it can't happen. Uh, you know, it's well, yeah, intimidating. But, you know, information can be stopped. It, it, it doesn't end that way. It just doesn't, it isn't always going to be there. Um, and so I always had a kind of real soft spot in my, my heart about that story. You know, um, when I first saw the film, I had forgotten about uh, Truffaut and Fahrenheit. And I thought, hey, where did they go get all those big, typical New Yorker who read it? <laughs> <laughs> they really must be caught out and sold them in from somewhere. Because they, or it could be more familiar somehow. It's, it's about losing, losing who we are, really and losing uh, the literature's memory of, of humanity. Right? And that Fahrenheit, the Great Bradbury story, always struck me that way. And then I so, so beautifully realized by Truffaut and Bernard Herrmann's music and Oscar Werner and, you know, uh, Julie, Julie Christie, what can you do? You try it. There are many different versions of it, but this is what I wound up with. Terrific work, all of you, congratulations. And uh, I wanted to ask you, I've always been a great fan of all your work, and I, I love the relationship of music and how you narrate, you know, with, uh, you have a beautiful score here as well, jazz, and very, very subtle, great. Um, it seems like uh, also the music plays the, the, the role of a journalist telling the story, you know, with Dylan's and, you know, George Harrison. And I wanted to ask you your relationship with music, you know, and how, how, how do you get inspired with music? The question is about the, the use of music uh, in, in the film and also how, generally how music inspires. Well, it's just something that's part of the first things I can remember in my life is music. Um, as I said, the, the culture I came from, the, the really, we're in the habit of reading, so it was mainly visual, but mainly music. Popular music, um, classical too, whatever, whatever I hear. And so, music for me, I, I saw images in my mind when I listened to it. I was three years old, four years old, five years old. Um, and so, for me, music is the communication, it's the link. Um, and that's why I'm always drawn to uh, stories about music or music theory. Here, the music is um, uh, yeah, different. Well, there's, is it the modern jazz? Yeah, there is. Modern jazz? That's a record. Um, that I found in a garbage bag when I was about 12. And we picked up anything that you could play with at the time. Not you know, Open City or Street Shop, but I mean, <laughs> it was the Bowery, you know, there's this incredible record that had a scratch on it, it had a yellow label, I don't know what it was. And I just put this on, there's this incredible piece of music. And, and it took me years, it took me about until 12 years ago to find out what it was. And I said, I always hear it in my head, because I had not I had very few records, so I would play the same ones over and over. Um, and I never knew what it was. Um, and I found out what it was. I said, this would go perfect here. And uh, Moon Indigo, for example. Yeah. And uh, it, it's just perfect for that story. We tried other things. We tried punk versions of Blowing in the Wind. Uh, didn't quite work. Uh, in different places. But, uh, no, the music, what else did it? Well, I, I was just going to say that uh, it, it's interesting, the area of the Follow the you know, Soviet Union and the, the rise of the Eastern European and South area and stuff. That montage, we had a hundred pieces of music, and um, in, in a way, the movie dictates what the music is going to be. It's that cliche, you know, classical opera. Um, we had, I think, something slightly different in Berlin. And so it's like, no, there's this Czech composer. You know, they're Czech. Oh, you just, you, you, say, you don't use that music. <laughs> He said, no, he said, come on, it's, it's, it's Hungary, you're going to use Hungary. Oh, no, no, no. I was like, oh, okay, it's a work in progress, right? And, uh, and, we, and we put the miles in the photo. Well, I was dead, so. Yeah, it was something, you know, this American jazz. There's a lot of American 
Jets. You know, I think it's all of it. But very tricky, very hard to picture the score that way. Dude, Brubeck. Brubeck, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was getting ready one morning. I kept hearing take five on the radio. <laughs> take five, take five. But it wasn't, the, it wasn't the recording. It wasn't the studio version.